So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. I am Dotson Adebayo, and I'm going to try and keep things in a musical perspective because we look at an iconic match and the musical background to that, and also what was going on in the times. And you are? I'm Tim Vickery, and we have a very special guest today. We have the, the president of the Football Writers Association. We have the journo who is the grand inquisitor thrusting her microphone in the face of the coaches and so on. And I've never seen her on the other side. Tim, how long is this introduction going to take? Not long, just bear with me, <laughs> bear with me. I've never seen her on the other side having the questions at her. So the grand inquisitor being inquisitated, if, that, if such a word exists, she is... <laughs> Carrie Brown, and because she's the president of the Football Writers Association, we have afforded a, a, a privilege that we've never done before. We, we, before, we've always chosen the game and then found someone to talk about it or just droned on about it ourselves. This time, we let the president of the Football Writers Association choose the game, and after some, after some higgling and pigling and, 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 and whatever... My first question, and I've always wanted to do this. Hey, Carrie Brown, what's your <laughs> game now? <laughs> <laughs> so what game have you chosen? And welcome to the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. Thank you so much. Um, oh, it just reminds me of, I just watched the um, amazing Jack Charlton um, interview um, by Gabriel Clark and, and his team. And there was a lovely Jack Charlton. Hey, hey, Jack. It's all very very sad um yeah i have chosen the 2009 champions league final the dawning of the guardiola era because it was the press conference strangely that just keeps on nagging at the back of my mind it was match day minus one that awful uefa term that's come into common phraseology and i just turned around and said to someone but he's going to, he's going to go in with a high press. He's going to go in full throttle. And everyone said he can't. It's suicide. He wouldn't dare, not in a Champions League, because people didn't then. Champions League finals were dull. They were boring. Everyone sat back. It was a midfield tactical masterclass. And he changed the world of football from that day forth. So much so on Hackney Marshes. <laughs> we have players <laughs> playing out for the back. Tackling is dead. It's good criminality. Uh, not quite. Um, but yeah, it's amazing that I just, that, that whole season of which I was so lucky to just be a part of in a small way was, it was such a gear change for football, such a starting point for football. And um, yeah, so it will always remind, remain really special to me to be, well, there for that and for the semi-final at Stamford Bridge mm. as well. So maybe that was when I got the real mindset that there was no way this was going to be a midfield tactical battle, that Pep was going to go full pout, that Tic Tac was going to completely, completely railroad or just stun Manchester United, this great Sir Alex Ferguson, who will always be for me in, in the opening era of my career the greatest for what he did for that club i'm so Harry, glad you've chosen oh, this just, game just very quickly i think you might want to turn your volume down a little bit carrie slightly over modding no 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 don't apologize i didn't want to uh, break up the flow it was a really good answer um, i'm just so glad you've chosen this game for this reasons because i think this is something that can be taken for granted the extent to which Guardiola changed football and how dull it was before uh, and how he did things that were considered impossible. And the way that the game was going was this midfield battle of players who were like Olympic athletes, bigger, faster, stronger. And it was, it was like a RoboCop sport, wasn't it, for a while? And the Champions League finals were, were dull games. They were, they were battles of attrition quite often. And Chelsea, Man United, Man United were the reigning European champions. Chelsea, Man United the year before. If you're a neutral, you know, it's dramatic, yeah. But, you know, there's, there's, not, there's not a lot to inspire. And Guardiola came along, decided that, 
everything we, we, uh, um, that uh, it wasn't impossible. You could have little midfielders. You could have a, a game based on possession of the ball. And it was an absolute fever, wasn't it? I, I always I loved him as a player, Guardiola. I wasn't there in 2009. I'm very, very jealous also because I've never been to Rome, despite twice having tickets in my hand. I've never been there. Uh, but I was at Wembley in 92 when they won for the first time. And Guardiola was, uh, was the player who, who most impressed me because he directed the play from deep. He would allow Ronald Koeman to go forward and he would cover defensively, but he would also put, play the first ball out uh, and he would make the pitch big because that first ball was usually to the, to the wingers. And then you got the angles of passing opening up and, and tippity-tap, tippity-tap, tippity-tap. It was just great to watch. So I remember on, on, on the, the, the phone-in, um, when he was appointed, thinking, whoopee, you know, saying, look, watch out for this. This is going to be great. But his first two games were a disaster. They lost one and drew one. They were near the boss line. They were near the bottom of the, of the first division. He's used up his political capital getting rid of Ronaldinho. That's a huge decision. This man is the greatest player in the world. But Guardiola is, no. He's on the downward slide. He's, he's not only is he out of control. Also, if we leave him, he, he's going to take everyone else out of control as well. So he gets rid of Ronaldinho. He gets rid of Deco who he think who he's, he puts in the same thing. He wants to get rid of Samuel Eto'o and is persuaded against it. He's persuaded that Eto can be part of his project. And, and remember, Messi's like 21 or something. Building the team around this 21-year-old, now it looks obvious with hindsight, but then it's a massive, massive gamble. So everything that he was doing was such a massive gamble. But look at the influence it's had on the development of the game and look how the game has improved as a spectacle, as a result. But that influence didn't start with this particular match, did it, Carrie? The 27th of May, 2009, the Champions League final in Rome, Manchester United versus Barcelona. The, the way that Tim describes that uh, Pep Guardiola had this huge impact on the game and revolutionised it. But it didn't start then, did it? Oh, no, it goes all the way back to Marcelo Bielsa and <laughs> La Masia and, and the whole history of that um, remarkable club. But just for me, it was that moment when a, a complete clash of styles. You have to understand there is no way that Alex Ferguson and Manchester United foresaw that they would lose this. Rio Ferdinand had a calf injury about a week before the match and did a sit down interview. I'm sorry, there is a glitch on your mic. Sorry, Carrie, oh, there is a glitch. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. No, and honestly, it's not your fault. Uh, Mark, any ideas what that glitch could be? Is it better without it? Is that better? Yeah, much better. Much better. Much yeah, better without, without it. it. I don't know what the glitch yeah. could be. There we are. Yeah. Apologies. Much, much better. Um, no, no problem. Should I pick up from your answer? Yeah, your question, yeah, yeah. So, well, the question oh, was basically, it didn't start there, did it? This revolutionising mm. of the game. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> this started all the way back from Bielsa, La Masia, and the wonderful impact that had on Pep Guardiola, who was, has been such a servant of that to this day onwards, and all the coaches that he's revolutionised uh, since. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Vickery can tell you more about that than than I. I am a, just a passing <laughs> observer, although I have done my part to try and be a bit of a disciple of this remarkable um, past few decades in European football. But it was something, it was this clash of styles. It really felt like a changing of the guard. And Manchester United did not foresee that they would lose this. They were looking to win the first back-to-back -back titles in this new Champions League era, certainly in English football. Rio Ferdinand had done a sit-down interview with The Guardian about a week ahead, talking about his calf injury, but saying, you know, our front three, Ronaldo, Park and Rooney, I'd swap for Eto, I wouldn't swap them for Eto, Henry and Messi. Um, <laughs> we're not afraid of them. We can, <laughs> we can take them on. Um, there was no, there was no fear. They, they genuinely were looking to the, they were looking beyond. They were looking to it's defending their interesting that you mentioned Rio and, because uh, I know that Rio Ferdinand is absolutely haunted by this game. And by the one two years later, 
when uh, when United this this 2009 is a very even game and United could have won it. 2011 in Wem- at Wembley is is it's Crushes. very very one sided. It's a, it, it is the definitive performance perhaps of 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 the of the Guardiola Barcelona, but Rio Ferdinand I, I was working with him during the 2014 World Cup and as you know in a World Cup there is nothing else apart from the World Cup, with the possible exception of transfer gossip. But I, just at the moment, kind of off the air, Rio, apropos of nothing, he said, you know, those two Champions League finals against Barcelona, tactically, we got them both really, really wrong. You know, it's, it's obviously something that was still eating away at his, at, at, his, at his brain. 2011, I can't imagine what they could have done. 2009, well, firstly, they are dominating the game until Barcelona get the first goal and it's Samuel Eto who gets it. But up until that point, is that your memory of the game, Carrie? Up until that point, United yeah. are dominant. Well, I thought that to start with, they had their tactics right because they, they knew that Valdez had this kind of one, one fault in that he would parry balls <laughs> back out into um, an opportunity to then seize on it and get it back in the, in the net. And so... They had Ronaldo taking pot shots from the off, didn't they? And then he had that brilliant free kick. And as they expected, Valdez parried it away. And it was only a brilliant PK clearance that denied them the goal in the first few minutes. There were other shots from distance. And you really thought that Ronaldo was, was going to do something. And that at that time, I'd been pitched side for all the build-up and the opening ceremony, which is a very grand cultural affair. It's before we got the big pop acts in and um we couldn't get back to the stand so we were amazing we were standing don't hate me around the sort of olympic track that i had um behind the goal so that was just extraordinary we always saw the goal go in but it was at that point so i suppose the camera angle picks up too many people and we were ushered to find our seats so um it really felt like that was going to be the turning point but the minute that eto goal went in On the eighth minute, when Manchester United had literally sent Cristiano out to try and get an error from the goalkeeper, to try and give themselves that chance, or as he'd done in the previous rounds, to actually get the ball in the net, as he did so proficiently from distance. The minute the Eto'o goal went in, it wasn't just that they sat back, it wasn't just that they were stunned, it was complete capitulation. I I couldn't quite remember how long it went on for that you just couldn't understand why Manchester United were not getting back into this game well I think it has a lot to do with Messi making the extra man in midfield and then you you can't get the ball off them because they're typically tapping in all all over the place but I know that, that Guardiola looking back at this game afterwards thought you know what we weren't quite as good as we as 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 we can be and I think a lot of that has to do with the with the team that he had that he had to put out, which both worked for them and against them. In that, they've got injuries and they've got suspensions, and they don't have the fullbacks. And you know how important, from an attacking point of view, the fullbacks are for Barcelona. They don't have Daniel Alves, so uh, Puyol has to play there. You know, he's started there, but he's really be- he's become a centre back, uh, and uh, the left back. It was Abidal, I think, is, is suspended. It's Abidal, yeah. Yeah, Silvino plays. It's his last game. And here, on the one hand, I think having those two defensive fullbacks, it harmed Barcelona's elaboration because they had fewer options to, to, to pass the ball. But I certainly think, from the point of view of Puyol, it probably improved them defensively because that's where United are strong down that flank you know they've uh, they're, they're really coming down that flank where i think i can't understand what united did is that silvino veteran last match he could have taken a deck chair out because playing that side that that side at the start is park who's not a winger he's, he's park is cutting into the penalty area all the time and the thing that i i couldn't understand it at the time and i still don't understand it now is why they never thought why don't we put Cristiano Ronaldo out and have a go at Silvino for a while? Because there, I'm, I'm convinced they, 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 could have, they could have done some damage. 
they were missing Fletcher as well, weren't they? And he was such a key, one of the players that could run and run and run on the park. And he was such a loss to them. And somehow Barcelona managed to diffuse the impact of Michael Carrick, who was an important person for Manchester United in terms of keeping the ball moving all about the place. But one thing that I take from this game, it's it's ironic, and it won't be the first time I've seen Manchester United do this, because I saw them do it to Tottenham at uh, semi-final of the FA Cup a couple of years back when Tottenham were playing at Wembley. The shortest guy on the pitch gets the definitive header. No, that's it. What, what was going on there, mate? Uh, Messi the scoring with his head. The amazing thing about that is I'd moved up then to the heights and I was actually looking down from the gods onto that goal, which was fortunate enough. But I've, I've actually been rewinding it back today because in my mind, as Rio Ferdinand watches the cross go over his head and says, there's no way he's going to get that. And then <laughs> so here's the crowd <laughs> and turns and every recurring nightmare comes. <laughs> It's extraordinary the height he gets. Uh, he gets higher than Rio, who's six foot or five. And um, this extraordinary height. But from where I was sitting, yeah, he, he was on a jet pack. I was up in the gods looking down. But to mine, he raised, in my mm -hmm. mind, at that moment, you know, some of those moments are so quick. You know, like, I was there, but it's, I wish I, I did see it. But it was so quick. Uh, no, that didn't happen. The cross came in. It it was just that those rare, wonderful slow mo moments where everyone just takes a breath and you can't understand why he's rising so high. But I've been watching it back on video because I'm like, yeah, it's amazing that he's that high and that he's over Rio. But for me, he was on a jetpack heading it down towards goal because it was so extraordinarily <laughs> out of any context that he could get this high, that he could be so accurate, that he could be so light but then not so strong on the on the field it's just yeah just will will stick in my mind forever and we've we've seen it again and again haven't we since but that well, it's like i say i saw sanchez do that to manchester united as well so they're making something of a habit about it was it a game carry of two halves given the goals from barcelona came one in each half was it a game of two halves because I, I get the impression that Certainly from Samuel Eto's goal, it was one prolonged half, if you know what I mean. One half yeah. of eight minutes and another half of 82. <laughs> exactly, exactly just, so. Yeah, it, was, it was just baffling and bewildering that this is Sir Alex Ferguson's most resilient, and they were, look, as much as I say the finals were, you know, quite often boring and strategic, this is the sexy brilliant wonderful Sir Alex Ferguson's prime prime players one of the most exciting teams of, of that generation without a single doubt and they just they didn't know what to do they just as you say um they couldn't cope with Iniesta they couldn't cope with Messi they couldn't understand why they were a man down when they had all 11 men on the pitch um it was Fergie didn't rise to the occasion on that day and still well, couldn't find a solution for him at Wembley. Remember that he, he'd beaten Barcelona in 1991, which was the Cruyff Barcelona mm. in the final of the European Cup Winners' Cup. And it was there were many similarities. So he, he thought it was the same thing. And I think the previous year, they'd beaten Barcelona in the, in the semi-finals of the Champions League on the way to the final. It was nil-nil there and one-nil at Manchester. So they thought they knew how to defend against them. But there was a different threat from the, from, from, from the Guardiola Barcelona, wasn't it? There was the ability to press the ball better and the ability to keep the ball better and, and, and make them run around after it. Do you remember the impact that this made on the English press corps? I know everyone was stunned. It literally was, it was such an anticlimax because... It was a bit of a strange one arriving in Rome anyway, because of the strict policing, they'd actually stopped serving alcohol for the night before the game. They completely locked it down. So I went for dinner with Paul Hayward and a few of the print boys and we went and, and the, the steps were empty. It was deserted. It was most peculiar. It was an absolute lockdown to avoid any trouble and any violence. There'd been a bit 
a feistiness in the, in the days before. So it was it was not like a Champions League final on the day, on the night before, but there was this great buzz and we were all meeting up in lovely Roman palazzos and, and it was that whole Brits abroad and people trying to summon up the everyone's a Manchester United fan, <laughs> which they weren't. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was, it did feel like it was, our England weren't very good. So we did, we were living vicariously through every Champions League final. And it did, it seemed like an end of the British era. We'd had Manchester United and Chelsea in that final. Yes, decided by a slip on a grass. But um, <laughs> um, it was, yeah, I think everyone knew what was to come. And I- You knew that as journalists then? As journalists, you, you felt that this was the end of that, English dominance in Europe? I think we knew that Messi, we already knew that Messi and Xavi and Iniesta were something like we'd never, well, we'd be following them for a bit, but over that over that year, Chelsea, at Stamford Bridge, um, it, it was magical. It was magical. Um, the Iniesta goal wasn't magical for me because I'd had to go outside and interview fans just right at the end of the match and all I heard was just screams and you, you knew you missed an absolute sensation. It sounded great from out in the car park. Um, but, you know, it's just you walk back in like you have, you've missed the, forget all the the three penalties they were denied and all the fights in the corridors that kept on going against UEFA for every Champions League match after that. But, um, uh you just knew there was something incredibly special about this team and was there a resistance to it amongst the English no no there was a no complete respect I think but I think as uh, the majesty of Messi especially that night with that I mean that was you know the salmon (laughs) leaping from the waters but just also so and and you know in yesterday I mean if you in yesterday it's probably in Chavi a in their prime, just the three of them, how do you pick between them in terms of quality of player? But um, there was no, um, I think it was a bit of embarrassment at how one-sided it was, but no one, no, the big thing, the, the big thing afterwards was that Ronaldo was leaving for Manchester United, but it wasn't certain. And I'd had quite a good relationship with Cristiano in the mix zone, because I think I was one of the only women, but I wasn't, it wasn't very, he was very polite and he's got a younger sister, I think. So I think he sort of, he was very polite in making sure he looked out for me and, and would give me a sound bite or two. Um, and I didn't think he'd stop and talk to us, but he talked to, I think, Spanish TV and, and then came to us and said, wasn't quite I'm leaving, but it it, it was the end. And we only have a two only have a two people to get that get that. So that was one of the big one of the big the big story, the minute it was all over, is this Cristiano Ronaldo gone? And I think that's why there was the sense of the shift as well. Um, he was leaving for Spain. That's where the battle was. That's where everyone wanted to be. This is the new Old Trafford was the destination. Now it's, I mean, the Bernabeu always was with the Galacticos, but this is, it did feel everyone was heading, heading to Spain or to Barcelona and Catalonia. But um, the other story (laughs) to put that leaping header into context is um, Messi doesn't like doing media. I think we all know that. He's, he'll do it. He's quite shy. He's also very clever not to ever give a headline. Um, but <laughs> it's a great moment in the mix zone. We've done Cristiano Ronaldo and we were waiting for some other people. And then I think an English player came past and I was interviewing them. And then the trophy went past with some a couple of the team. I can't even remember which players. And they were just carrying but it was strange they were carrying the trophy and sort of holding it up for everyone to see but that's how Messi got out of the mix zone he stood behind the Champions League trophy as his teammates sort of carried it along he was standing behind it and so no one saw him go through the mix zone he hid behind the Champions League trophy that's how that's how big he is (laughs) they weren't billing it they weren't billing this particular match as Ronaldo versus Messi as they would subsequently but to in in some respects it was um, certainly Manchester United's outstanding player would have been uh, Ronaldo although I think he was misused as the pot shot taker uh, that seemed to distract him from what he should have been doing in the end he ended up getting a, a yellow card because he was running all over the pitch and decided to do a bit of defending but 
it's not as clear on the Barcelona side that the uh, sent out player was Messi. It, not in a team with Iniesta anyway, let alone Xavi. Um, but I could see this match being the beginning of, you know, the way that you said that Ronaldo more or less announced that, look, you know, Spain's the place to be. That's the league to be in. And he was right in that. He 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 was correct, you know, for his own sort of uh, grandeur and stature as a footballer, he needed to be there competing on a weekly basis, more or less, with um, Lionel Messi. Was he competing in this match? Was, was, was there yeah, any it was that... already Ronaldo Messi. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was already building up very nicely. Yeah, it, it's... And I've, I've been so lucky to keep keep watching the development of that relationship although it's you know it does seem to say, be reaching its its um final climax doesn't it but it's been extraordinary to watch them challenge each other from hat trick to hat trick on champions league nights to um i did a classico with them at the new camp where they both scored and it was just simply magnificent um they are um they have driven each other and and i i wonder if Ivor would have quite reached the heights without that drive week in, week out. Um, I will never. It's Federo talking. Nadal, isn't it? Federo yeah, Nadal, essentially. Exactly. And how it's, lucky uh, we are! Uh, is is this? Does this? Do these two great talents in two sports always throw themselves up in every generation? I wonder. I, I think we've been absolutely blessed, blessed with them. But it's um, and their extraordinary journeys. I was lucky enough to be in Argentina for the Copa America. Mr. Vickery <laughs> and I headed to um, Rosario to meet his youth coach um, who's now a, a mechanic strangely enough and um, it, it's wonderful to just know that this is still an area that's almost so well we've talked about this haven't we quite relaxed about the legend that is Messi because he's not the legend in his own country that he is in Europe but um, if you go to Newell's Old Boys and where he still goes and sits in the stands and watches the games he's he's always not as highly revered as Bielsa is there but um it's he, his journey and Barcelona backed him all the way through a young age where he needed medical treatment to grow and to come through La Masia and to be the historical you know force that he is that's so representative of that club so representative of Guardiola and everything that club is it's um Quite, quite the tale and you have to I'll, I'll claim a little bit of English touch to it because if Newell's old boys wasn't there in the first place <laughs> Isaac Newell the English teacher pardon Isaac Newell he was an English teacher yes yes with a, with a German wife so um the Germans uh, are there as well it's uh, I suppose it's lucky that um Barcelona didn't overdo it with that hormone growth treat, yes. uh, treatment of Messi otherwise he'd have been too big to hide behind the Champions League trophy but, uh, <laughs> He'd have had to speak to you in the mix zone. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. Don't knock him for that. Uh, do you remember what was in the news at the time at all, Carrie? What was oh. in uh, the general news and uh, where Britain was? I think she's time. she's living in that bubble where there is nothing else <laughs> apart from the final of the Champions League. It is well, no, all that is happening. That's awful. Sorry, I didn't check that. I checked music. But I didn't no, no, d- don't worry, don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> well, no, but you might remember who was Prime Minister at the time. Um, it was a certain Gordon Brown, the last gasps of his uh, premiership, knocking on the door was a certain David Cameron. And it was at this point, apropos nothing at all, that uh, I made my first impact on the politics of the United Kingdom by getting uh, David Cameron in a hustings ahead of the uh, 2010 election in a hustings uh, to say, to commit to um, were he to become uh, the prime minister of Great Britain uh, to commit to uh, changing the law. It's called Dotton's Law. Uh, you want to check that one out if you can. Well, you don't have to. Yeah, not for my benefit. Makes no difference to me at all. However... Um, you can't leave us there. You are going to elaborate on what the law is. No, no, can't check it out for yourself. What, Come what on. What can and, we football... can't and can't we do because of you? <laughs> 
Okay. That's exactly. I, I think I know this already, but I've, the things I know and I've forgotten uh, are far too. <laughs> Don't worry about that. But Tim's absolutely right. Uh, I impose a law that restrains you from being able to do uh, a few things, um, but I didn't allow you to do very much else. But there you go. Mm-hmm. A- anyway, in the charts, as you talk about the charts, I have Tim... to ask you about David Cameron. Did you find him a reasonable man? Did you foresee he would be perhaps considered one of the most evil men in the UK? Well, you can speak for yourself on that one, but <laughs> thank you, no, thank you for trying to get me into trouble. But no, I'm going to sit on the phone. I will explain but, in a minute. Yeah, but um, I'll she tell you the, what. She's the great inquisitor. Well, so, no, she, well she, done, she's you. Well on you. <laughs> He's my. He was my local MP. Ah, is, so I, I can you. say because I don't. I don't think he set out to be the most evil man. No, sure. He seemed like a decent guy. He had decided to do uh, hustings in Peckham, which was like a hustings from the great and the good of the black community. I, of course, gate crashed. And um, I sat there and listened to him and I saw that his personal touch, it was kind of uh, man of the people um, touch, you know, took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeves and tried to be as... uh, I don't think he was walking on eggshells. He, he, he wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I better not say anything that might be misconstrued. It wasn't kind of like that. But he tried to give the impression that he was definitely the friend of the black community, which was a really important time um, or uh, an important distinction to make because this was a time where the Conservative Party haven't rejected the naturally conservative black vote in uh, the late 40s or the 50s, if you like, and 60s and so on. They rejected that. The people that came over on the Windrush, 1948, 21st of June, they were conservative by nature. If you think about it, when a migrant community decides, look, I'm better off sacrificing everything to go and try this other country, to try my luck also like this the, other they're, they're the secretarial middle class, aren't they, of Jamaica 100%. that's coming over? Hundred percent. Certainly, the one woman on the boat was literally from the Jamaican secretarial class. The others were a mixture of tradesmen, which arguably, in the Jamaican context, was middle class. Certainly, lower there middle class. There was a lot of RAF people as well. People who've been in the RAF during the war. Absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Hundred percent. And these people didn't fit in back in Jamaica in right. a kind of a weird way. They were British war heroes, but in Jamaica, you know, what do you do? You go back to becoming a um, uh, 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 in some cases, teacher or something like that. Well, but- talking of, of these these kind of journeys, I mean, one thing which, which fascinates me about Carrie is that you're a farm girl. Yeah. So rustic environment, and I'd imagine quite a right wing, quite a conservative environment. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. We'll, 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 let, we'll let her go through okay. that. And yeah, then... Yeah. <laughs> And this is my supposition, which yeah. one we will now confirm or deny. <laughs> and then perhaps through your career in journalism, you have been urbanised and Ooh. taken on a, a, a political and social direction, which has opened you up in all kinds of interesting ways. Is that a fair summation? Yeah, sort of. Um, my to explain it my mum and dad were quite a good match um my my dad came from the merchant navy of uh generations of merchant navy officers um and so they traveled the world um and they felt it was really important we traveled the world and saw cultures and appreciated culture so they were the antithesis of everything we're seeing today uh, in our society mm-hmm. some horrific front pages um and so they were very um wanted us to be very worldly wise um my grand and the other side of my family were veterinarians and my grandfather served in uh the war in india and came back and had learned urdu and just spoke a million different languages Mm. um so very much the same wanted us to be very well educated and that's that's a really nice thing to have up at that side of that family were incredible um you would think of as leper colonies a really bad thing, or I thought it was. Um, in fact, they were set up to help the lepers that were on the street that weren't being treated. And my great uncle um, 
can't remember the island. It's a very nice island now in Hong Kong, but he he went and saw one was in quite a bad state and completely took it over and looked after all the people on and and ran and ran and restored the leper colony um, just as a complete. That's how he spent his rest of rest of his life caring for those people um, and and got lots of um, and was praised very much for it and saved a whole community. So they're <laughs> very open-minded caring people so in that sense yes um I, I have always been aware of uh racism and hatred and my family never wanted us to be a part of that um and but then it became my eyes are very much but it's a Tory stronghold where we come from and and uh, it's a very different our council estates have their remarkable a council house where I come from has a front garden, a back garden, a driveway, a car park, and it's upstairs, downstairs, two bedrooms, three bedrooms upstairs. <laughs> the council estates are, you know, they it's like little Havana. It's just uh, it's a different world. So when people, you know, when people talk about council estates and they don't quite understand what our world, what central London is, and and what poverty is, and uh, understand enough about the horrors of the Windrush generation and the racism and the terror they have and then <laughs> very sadly I've, I've full, had a very um, horrible introduction of just how bad fascism is in this country and, and it was an undercurrent but now it's very much the worrying thing is people don't know the undercurrent that what we're seeing now is the tip of the iceberg and if we're seeing it we're in trouble. My um, best friend's father was mar uh, murdered by a neo-Nazi walking back from a mosque in Birmingham and uh, yeah so We've um, helped to deal with that, but she's been fighting against Islamophobia ever since. And because of that, she gets targeted by the fascists all the time with death threats and terrorism. And yeah, that opened, you know, it, I just it, well, I opened my eyes very quickly. It, it's a really hard one. Uh, yesterday, as you as you all know, Carrie, uh, less so you, Tim, over in Brazil, <clears throat> the government uh, released the conclusions of some... <clears throat> Um, you know, government think tank uh, about racism. And the think tank has been headed by somebody that I know, and I know really well, Tony Saul, known him for 35 years and published a book by him, actually. His book published, published a novel by him called Jamaica Inc. about 1994 wow. or something, 94 maybe, around that time. So I've known him really, really well. Um, and he went and published this thing with the conclusion that uh, Britain was uh, no longer institutionally racist. And it's had quite a backlash. And it, it's a very difficult one when, you, you know, you're faced with something like that, when you have a, like, a personal connection to something like this. You know, you mentioned your friend whose father was murdered. You know, very difficult and very different circumstances, I know. But nevertheless, w when you become sort of personally involved in something because of your connection to somebody it takes on a, a different dimension you know it, it becomes well it, it becomes um, I was going to say personal but you know, do you know what I mean it, it just it's very hard what you said about David Cameron at the very beginning because he made a promise to me ahead of him becoming elected as prime minister because he made a promise that nobody else would have remembered but me even though it was a packed uh, hustings he made a promise that if he became prime minister he would look to change the law in this particular respect and then when he did it within a month of becoming prime minister I thought fuck you know fair enough mate you know I didn't expect that from politicians not where I grew up in any case and these things just twist and change warp maybe the way that you view a lot of things i do know what you mean about the council estate i always laugh with my daughters that um i lived on lordship lane and my missus whilst i was growing up in lordship lane was growing up on lordship lane the only difference is i grew up on lordship lane in tottenham which is basically broadwater farm she grew up in lordship lane in lechford which has got lechford. a nice yeah, Letchworth, um, which has got a nice sort of uh, lawn at the front, semi-detached. Um, it's a different Lordship Lane um, experience. My council well. flat in, in, in Hemel Hempstead, which is near Letchworth and very similar, was a flat. Yeah, yeah. That was a One proper floor, flat. Yeah, 
that was a proper fact. None of this, none no, of this. Uh, no, they this. had a two-story house, mate. You no. know. Yeah, but the, see, movement... but the, the original idea of council housing was, uh, and this is very strong in the post-45 thing, it's for the middle classes as well. It wasn't just working-class housing. It was supposed to be. Uh, and Nye Bevin, who, as well as starting the National Health Service, also had, had a mass, it was also responsible for housing, and a mass build. And he said, all right, people with, are desperate for houses, but in, in 10 years' time, we won't be remembered for the quantity, we'll remember, we're remembered remembered for the quality. So that there was a tradition of, of, of council housing, which well built. was, yeah. Uh, well and uh, it's just been, it's been ghettoized now. And for me, uh, it, institutional racism and so on, social mobility has died. Because it, it's almost impossible. And how do you do it now? How do you do it when you're paying a foot, you're paying fifty percent of what you earn to a landlord? If you want to get a college education, there's more and more debt and no guarantees at the end of it. Uh, and uh, obviously, that affects most who is at the bottom of the pile, who are usually the most most recent immigrants. And the well, the hardest thing to hear about this report that came out yesterday was it was suggesting that um, uh, black Asian. Um, um, minority backgrounds were doing better at college and in education than white men well in some respects they are mm-hmm. but the point is it was feeding to a racist narrative mm. this is that's exactly what you know the tommy robinsons of the english defense league said what about the white boys eh? what yeah. about, i mean <laughs> a few in a very small demographic of white boys are not doing as well as yeah. the, you know little demographic of black boys and that is true in some tiny little respect in where where do you find <laughs> if we're looking at higher education in university where kids are stacking up thirty thousand pounds university debt for just sitting on zoom at the moment if you're looking at these areas where you really want to bring social mobility how can that how can that happen how can higher education happen it's- well just look at the boardroom i mean <laughs> let alone you know uh, people of black and asian and mixed heritage what how many women are there there in the boardroom i mean it's exactly you, the same you can't argument. do it now from my background you can't mm. and mm. i had council housing i had uh, uh, um university education that wasn't only free they paid you to go yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah I, I had enjoyed when it. I left. I, had, I bought I had a motorcycle. Scheme, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he sent me a grant. I bought a motorcycle. But there you go. And rode it all the way through to college. I've heard the stories. <laughs> <laughs> I crashed Vandal. it a few times as well. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the great old days. Should you have a quick look at the pop charts, though? Because do we have uh, to? Yes, we do. <laughs> See, the thing is, Carrie, I knew even as I looked at the pop charts on my own, I knew Tim was going to hate it. It's the <laughs> worst collection it. of rubbish that we've <laughs> well, ever there seen. There is one. There is one. Ooh. That in 2009, we have to admit, we thought was just a pop trash Madonna wannabe. And you've got to say <laughs> Lady, Lady Gaga. Gaga was not that. And that was the first year she got into the UK charts, 2009. So uh, she's. You're absolutely right with that, with Lady Gaga. She has got talent. She can actually sing. Unfortunately for her, she went down the slightly novelty thing, um, which I think distracted from it. It's not until you see her duetting with Tony Bennett that you think, hang on, why would Tony Bennett? That's wonderful. I love her. Yes. Exactly. So Agreed. A wasted talent. Yeah, I agree. Although, no, I don't think it is wasted. I think it's like Carrie says. It's a journey. This is where that journey starts. You know, it may not be for everybody, but she probably wouldn't have made it into the music business if she had started off wanting to do a duet with Tony Bennett. You'd say, look, I'd like to help you, girl, but, you know, you just won't help my, my, how, my career. How important for you, Carrie? Because I, I often think about this as a, as, a, as a male thing, constructing identity around music. It's a male thing of, of our, of my and Dot and Jen's generation. You know, you just knew what someone was like from what they wore and what music they were into. Is it as important in the construction of a female identity as it is in ours? I was always a singer. So I used to always be going to gigs or with friends that were at gigs and gigging and we'd be playing porn on blondes and a guitar around the back of a... Um, the place got a place called the Jericho in Oxford when I grew up, which was a fantastic music scene. And we had very lucky um, in Spiral Carpets, Radiohead. Apparently, 
Noel, Noel was a roadie. I didn't know this at the time with In Spiral Carpets. Mm. And we were playing guitars, singing badly, just waiting for my friends. But singing um, better than four non blondes. I mean, that, that, that <laughs> just drives me <laughs> mad. <laughs> um, and, um, and he screamed at us. He thought we were just groupies hanging around us and screamed at us to bugger off. And I told him I wasn't going to bugger off. And I didn't know until, you know, 10 years later that that was apparently Noel Gallagher. <laughs> quite like that. <laughs> but yeah so it's yeah, um he he my best friend's boyfriend played for a band called the daisies and uh they're about to get signed and instead um oh i forget their name i can't forget their name oh what are they called oh well supergrass oh yeah i know the deal yeah. they're and from then, oxford as well by the way yeah. oh god yeah. yeah they're from oxford but yeah so um yeah they beat that was so yeah music was really important to me um and my identity, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. I think you were spot on identifying Lady Gaga. There's another female artist there that I think we should give a big shout out to. Um, Lily Allen. Lily Allen. Lily Allen, you see. When you hear, she's got a couple of tracks in the charts. This is why I will agree with Tim that it's a shit, shit chart in this respect. That there are too many artists with two or three tunes in the charts. You think, come on, there's so much music. Why, why are there two Lily Allen tracks in the charts? One's going down. Uh, anyway, but she's at number, um, in, in the top ten, at number seven with Not Fair, which ain't a bad track. It's That's got a little bit it's of a, a... It's a novelty US square dance kind of thing. Well, this it? is the thing. She turns it into her own thing, though, Tim. Uh, Lily Allen comes out of a sort of, uh, if you like, a, a kind of a white lover's rock musical background. And it's always going to be veering on the edge of pop. Yeah, that's where she comes from. She comes I love from there Smile, right? I think it's, I think it's a it's lovely, a brilliant record. track, and it's in English. Although I, I hate the London, kind of, I hate Cockney. the kind of upper middle class fake chav thing. No, it drives me mad not, that all of these people are privately chav educated. It's, it doesn't matter. I mean, just because you're privately educated, <laughs> fucking <laughs> matters. Yes. Yeah, well, no, no, no. <laughs> not in terms of judging it, judging the music. It might matter on a political level. Fair enough. But she has created something that is uniquely hers. When she takes a square dance, country western square dance kind of tune like this is, she turns it almost into a very London square dance kind of tune. It's not just from the way that she sings it. She's also the songwriter, remember. She's very creative with her writing, the lyrics of the writing to be very on point and so on. And I think she's... uh, one of the best stars in Britain still today, to be honest. She, you've she's constructed, lost her mojo a, you've a bit. constructed an excellent defence. Well done. You're no, I agree. So. No, I am. I am. I think it's good. Yeah. It's good. The, 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 the case for the defence uh, can rest. Happy with its work. Well done. No, she was a fight. I know it's the word fight. Women don't like fight. It's really hard to catch up with what people don't like anymore and whatever. But no, she was uh, outspoken. And there wasn't... I mean, the uh, female rap, is. it's the same with, you know... It, it's coming now it is, it's happening but um um it, she was feisty outspoken and and that was quite that was quite new it was quite new then so yeah like like that, and and I that. Forget- her, ly- her lyrics are great her lyrics absolutely are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and, and let's not forget alicia keys with no one as well in the charts i hate Tim. the song i mean i loved no, no i love no, that you don't no. know my name no, i loved no, it i just goodness. went mad on it i thought this no is a, one this is, is a, this is a female pop sensibility oh. of michael jackson at his peak i, I you loved, want to hear and i was so disappointed with everything else especially this you, one you, you want to hear how many mashups there are of this song and how m- many collaborations of rappers who want to rap on on this very song. And you hear her talking about it. I think on the album, she's talking about it to a live audience and she says, very rarely does this actually happen when you're, she's finished her album, she's wrapped up the album, about to lock up the studio and go off, and they just jam for a moment, she just starts jamming for a moment. She said, I don't know where this tune came from, but it came from somewhere deep. It's very, very rare. You know, uh, my band member, colleague, was started playing the acoustic guitar, and then just out of no, nowhere, this voice came out of me with these words, no one, this melody. And it is a true moment of musical inspiration but she was fed by a muse of this one mate and this is this is well, we're, we're gonna track. we're gonna disagree on that one no we've, no not we've, on this we've, one not on this one we've, Carrie. We've got... carrie's got the deciding vote though isn't she 
Oh, what what's it, what's it between? Alicia, just... just Alicia Keys. No one. Oh, this yes this or specific no. song because we we're, we're going to agree on Alicia Keys, but I don't like this song. I think it's, I'm I doing it. Does nothing lose. for me. I think you lose him. Sorry. I like being in an embittered minority. It, it, it comes <laughs> to me. Uh, we, 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 we've got to briefly, I think, do the number one, which is bonkers. Firstly, <gasps> because Barcelona and Man United. Barcelona drove everyone bonkers. Soon after this, uh, I saw the Brazilian coach, Carlos Alberto Pajera. He was coaching South Africa, preparing them for the World Cup. And he was giving a lecture to coaches and he was saying, you know what we're doing now? The players, every Barcelona game, they're crazy. They, it's all they want to see. So we're using things from Barcelona matches to, to, to try and coach the team. So it drove everyone. But Barcelona um, drove everyone bonkers. Uh, the records... What do you make of it, Dotton? Well, you've got to look at where um, Dizzy Rascal was. He is the guy that I suppose was the the bridge between what we now know as grime music and what was like two step in those days, um, <clears throat> what they used to call it. And he blew up big with Boy in the Corner, got to number one. This you know completely sort of surreal album. Bonkers, by the time you get to Bonkers, he's going pop here. He's had a few big hits, massive hits. In fact, he's got another track in the charts, which is better than Bonkers. But Bonkers, if you saw the video to it, for example, I haven't seen the video for many years, but it was like creating the kind of a cartoonish thing. So they've already branded him now. Whereas he came as a kid that had been stabbed about eight times in Ayanapa because he was like the big cheese on the pre-grime scene, as it were. Mm. He came as that with his sort of like real background, but then they eventually find out there's much more money in selling a load of records. That's become pop. So he's been created as a kind of a top cap pop cartoon character at this point, rather than, and and, and the music re- reflects that as well. What do you think, Gary? Was it Holiday that was the next one or was it a better one? Uh, no, gosh, I can't remember what the other track in the charts is, much lower down in the charts. Holiday's not bad, actually. Um, I don't know. He'd lost his point by then, though. Yeah, he got, very, bonkers, he got very mainstream. That's yeah. what I, but he, but I still he like the brilliant. geezer. I still yeah. like the geezer, just the way that he sounds, you know, it sounds so great to me. And uh, It was just far, like, sometimes, it's like um, Declan Rice at the moment. It sounds really strange to say. He looks like football's fun. Yeah. He, he has fun playing football. Yes. And Dizzy right. Rascal has, uh, yeah, he's got his grime and he loves his grime, but you know, that's serious, you know, darker than, than like che- cheesy pop tunes. Mm. But you know what? Uh, uh, for the summer soundtracks, you know, outside, all having a drink, it's all getting later, everyone's thinking of having a dance or not. It's just summertime sounds and they just, it's just stupid silliness and there's no harm in it just was he was the soundtrack of three summers and you're around the pool or you're in the sea and someone's playing it and times are good I remember Uh, those (laughs) and also did you never want to say bonkers Tim on a record like you know I remember the first time I I, I love that and I love the fact that because he's got an American techno nerd I think who kind of makes this horrible horrible it's kind of pseudo black music with no syncopation I detest it it was like that from the beginning (laughs) I do like the fact that he gets the American guy to suddenly say bonkers as well I like that (laughs) but if if, if I can have a final word if you want to sit around a swimming pool and listen to music then let it be the Players Association turn the music up, oh, which yeah. is groove. It is it is mint ice cream made into music. You don't want something that's going bang, 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 <laughs> bang with no syn- syncopation at all. Just this horrible dentist <laughs> drill of a no. What? What? what where? Where? Where, where in, have we gone wrong? In my father's house, there are many mansions. <laughs> on that note i think thank you both very much uh, carrie we, we only did half of what we should have done today so yeah. we'll get you back again if that's Please, all right. we'll i'd love one. to i'd love to and, and congratulations on passing your law because that's very very important to protect our children from some very nasty people thank you uh, of course